Hi chat. Hello. My computer is fighting with me today. I don't know what's wrong with it. Oh, I'm still fighting with this thing. Yes, we got PNG tuber today. And we've got the old lights. I still don't have expressions for for this guy, but that's okay. Anyways. Forgot how complicated I made this dude. <laughs> There's an ad break coming. I'm gonna snooze it. Anyways, how are you guys? Hope you guys are doing doing well. I'm gonna remake these lights tonight, by the way. And grind on making this better. Anyways, we're playing uh it's not ready. Why am I over here? Why does this keep happening? There we go. Now I'm in the right place. <laughs> we are playing swooning over stands today. Um, we've already played some of it, but it hasn't, uh, we didn't finish the route we were playing on, so. Hold on, I'm currently attempting to adjust some stuff. Um, I'm gonna go grab some water and I'll be right back. Okie dokie, I'm back. But yeah, sorry for the PNG tuber today. I'm just not feeling my best, admittedly. Sorry, I'm out of breath because I was running up and down the stairs. Okay, so yeah, we're playing this today. Um, right, okay. I don't really remember what happened last time, I'll admit. Um, I might turn on my camera in a bit, but for now it's gonna stay off. So I may even... Do it this way. Uh. 
feel like this is a better way to do it. Okay. Uh, someone thumps their fist on the storage room door, stirring you from sleep with a jolt and a thud as you fall off the mattress. Scrambling to your feet, you step over to the door and swing it wide. Swing it, swing it open wide. Tempest, I need your help. Uh-oh. It's at that moment that you look down to see Waddle swaddled in her arms, wearing a top hat and a small bow tie. Why is Waddles looking so dapper? He does look pretty dashing, doesn't he? Wait, we're not here to dish out compliments. There's an emergency. A love emergency. Mabel stares up at you with wide eyes, her little arms unmoving as Waddles attempts to wiggle free from her grasp. The kid's stronger than she looks. Tell me, Mabel, this could mean she has a new crush. From what Dipper's told you, she's still deeply rooted in her boy-crazy phase. Or she desperately wants to wed Waddles to some unsuspecting critter outside. Oh, Waddles and Gompers are renewing their vows today, and I can't find Gompers to put his gown on. You have to, you gotta help me find him. You weren't actually expecting your second guest to be right. Okay, wait, Mabel, just calm down for a second. But we have to find Gompers! The ceremony's in 20 minutes! Waddles wriggles himself free and runs down the hallway to freedom, ignoring Mabel's shriek of protest as he chases him. You're compelled to go back to bed, deciding this is almost definitely a dream, but jog after Mabel regardless. You catch sight of Mabel just as she leaps over Dipper, who's sitting on the floor with a large array of graph paper and chewed pencils. She runs to the back door, suspiciously open, after Waddles snorting self, yelling at him not to lose his tie. Mabel, what's going on? Waddles, wedding gumpers? You're a little out of breath. Mabel's fast. Uh, Dipper smacks a hand to his forehead, dragging it down to his face dramatically. Of course, she told me they're renewing vows or something. They got married last summer, but she misses the pizzazz of weddings. Dipper looks nonplussed. But you can tell he's at least a little invested. Are you gonna help her with whatever that was? I don't even know what's going on. Yeah, that's me before you. But it's her thing, I guess. There's a moment of silence. I'll help if you do. Thanks, Dipper. And with that, you run past him. Dipper stutters a surprise, growing fainter as you head outside. Mabel's already a ways away when you burst out into the shack's backyard. Fortunately, Stan and Ford are nowhere in sight. Not sure what you'd think of them finding you searching for a goat bride as Mabel calls out to lure Gompers home. Come on, Gompers, I already <laughs> booked the second honeymoon. The caterers are going to be mad. Runaway brides are so cliche. She's seriously invested in this farm critter marriage. That or she's watched way too many dramatic romance movies. Or both. Gompers, come on, goat. Pal, where are you? Your dipper head towards Mabel to help her look so you veer opposite, opting to cover more ground in search of the runaway goat bride. Let's look under the foundation. You duck onto your knees and look under the house. There's a large hole that leads somewhere underground, but you figure Gompers isn't down there if that's Ford's illustrious basement dipper's gushed about. Oh, on the roof. You walk backwards and put a hand to your brow, shielding your eyes from the sun as you search the scaffolding in the shack. Nothing. Continue walking to the side now until rays of sunlight obscure the view above the sign of the gift shop. Rather serendipitously, the cloud guys over glides overhead to block the sun. You're able to look up higher, seeing oh no, <laughs> seeing the misspelled lettering, the various wear and tear in the roof, and a small billy goat munching on part of the weather vane. Wait. Hey, Mabel! Yeah? You point up to the roof at Gompers. Here comes the bride. Mabel shrieks Gompers and sprints into the gift shop, slamming the door so hard the open sign flips to closed. There's a silence for a moment, then something flips open on the roof's small balcony, and Mabel pops out from underneath, climbing up onto the roof and attempting to coax go Gompers down. There's a ladder up to that little balcony thing inside the gift oh. inside the gift shop. It's pretty cool for fireworks. Mabel pulls a sandwich from her sleeve. You can't help but imagine what else she has up there, and waves it in Gompers' direction, and he trots towards the balcony. Hopping down to Mabel's level and snatching the sandwich from her hand. She grabs the goat and heads back down the ladder into the gift shop. Oh, Gompers, you can't get the pre-wedding jitters anymore. You're already married. You can't go away that easy. Thanks a billion, Tempest. You saved the wedding. 
And with that, Mabel gets to work on wrestling Gompers into his dress, yelling commands to Dipper to grab Waddles, who thankfully didn't get his bow tie dirty when he dashed away earlier, and get everything ready for the most important ceremony in the history of ever. Maybe an exaggeration, but Mabel's excitement is undoubtedly contagious. Okay, once Dip finds Waddles, I think we got everything ready. I am, of course, the the vicar? Caterer, proud mother, musical guest combo. Dipper's gonna take pictures from my scrapbook. Hey, I never agree to that. Dipper, please? I gotta of of officiate. Officiate? Yeah. Yeah, do you mean officiate? See, I'm so busy I can't even talk right. Please, Dipper, I'll help you f with some nerd thing later. I pinky swear. Dipper contemplates this hand at his chin, mirroring his grunkle forward, of course. As long as you actually do this time, then yeah, I'll take pictures. Mabel jumps up and down with excitement, jostling poor Gompers in her arms. Yay, thank you, Dipper, I owe you one. This is what the best brother looks like right here, Tempest. Haha, <laughs> okay, you don't have to do the whole thing again. I'll get back to... Waddles, you get back here. Okay, now that we have that fix, that means we have- Wait! Seuss left already, my ring bearer is gone! Oh no, what are we gonna do, Gompers? <laughs> Gompers gives the intelligent answer of, bah, chewing on his bridal veil. I could ask him, but I don't know. Gompers chooses at that moment to look into Mabel's eyes and bleed at her insistently. Mabel naturally takes this as a sign, a sign from Goat. You're right, of course. This is your special day. Again. Mabel turns to you with pleading eyes. Oh god. Dog is barking upstairs. <laughs> hey, Tempest, could you be the new ring bearer for the ceremony? Yeah. You give me no greater honor. I'm very invested in this partnership, Mabel. Gotta see it through. Uh, Mabel beams, obviously very pleased that you're taking this as seriously as she is. Thank you, Tempest. Let's get the show on the road. Or this wedding on on the backyard. It still works. Mabel runs back into the house and you hear her thudding upstairs faster than a hungry waddles. Gompers, thankfully, still occupied by the half a sandwich Mabel taunted him with, stays put. Yippee. Uh, she soon com she She comes back soon after with a fluffy purple pillow and two clear sticks. After snapping the sticks in half, glow sticks. They're glow sticks. She curls them into small bracelet-sized rings. These are so much more fun than rings. Plus, Waddles can put it on his tail to look super handsome. Waddles oinks in, agree in agreement. It's in this mad dash at the house he's lost his top at. Hold your hands up, palm up, and get down so you're not as tall. They can't put the rings on each other if you're way up there. She's got a point. You duck to your knees in the dirt, and Mabel turns your p hands palm up, re reverently placing the pillow and glow sticks ring atop them. Okay, Mabel, I'm here with the camera for Tempest. Why are you on the ground? You just to the happy couple with a wide arc of your arm. They needed a ring bearer. Well, I guess they do. Mabel nods, small hands on her hips. She looks over the wedding scene and mumbles to herself, checking things off a mental checklist. Okay, I think we have- Wait! I forgot the flower petals. I'll be right back. And she's gone again, leaving you alone with the pig groom, a goat bride, and two glow stick bands of matrimony. Goatrimony. That kind of works. You decide not to crack that pun on Dipper, who's examining his disposable camera. He pops the back open and sighs, smacking a hand to his forehead. This one's out of film. It must be the one Mabel used at Candy's party. He looks up at you and shrugs. I will get one of my spares. Make sure these two don't go anywhere or Mabel will... Well, you know Mabel. You haven't known Mabel as long as Dipper has, but you understand immediately. You're left alone in the backyard with the groom's pig, a bride goat, two glow sticks, and a broken disposable camera. While you love to say you've absolutely been in the situation before, you unfortunately have not. I really am very happy for you both, Waddles and, um, Gompers. Both animals turn to you, nonchalant to the current state of events. But I can't believe Mabel forgot the flower petals, jeez. Just as you go to continue the one-sided conversation between human, goat, and pig, you hear two voices coming around from the house. Two very familiar voices. Listen, Sixer, if you hadn't gone off about the wobbly junker, the gobble wonker, Stanley, has Dipper really never told you? Then you wouldn't have freaked out the kid at the store we needed and we'd have, oh, I don't know, the stuff to fix my house after you got a car stuck in it. 
It's still my house, and besides, if he was a fisherman, he needed to know- We'll stand in four around the corner to find you sitting on your heels next to waddles and gompers, brandishing a pillow and glow sticks in the dirt. The three of you <laughs> stare at each other in silence. Mabel needed a ring bearer for the wedding. So at that moment, Mabel kicks down the back door, runs to your side, and throws rose petals atop your head. Ta-da! You blow a rose petal off the tip of your nose and grin at Mabel. I think our bride and groom are ready to renew their vows, don't you? Mabel nods emphatically at you before turning to her grunkles, lighting up a hundred watt smile. Yes, grunkle stand, grunkle forward. You guys got back just in time. <laughs> and just like that, Mabel pushes Stan and Ford towards you and tugs their hands as they sit across from you. Stan complains about his knees, and Ford asks Dipper exactly why the pig and goat of Betrothed fits with what you know about both at this point. <laughs> Uh, Mabel makes way with the wedding, and you sit cross-legged, the pillow and glow stick rings on your lap. Every so often, Mabel stifles a theatrical sob, wiping a very real tear from her eye, before she turns to you for the rings. Oh, Mabel, how should the betrothed, um, wear their rings, since they don't have ring fingers? Just put them on where you think they fit best. I think around one goat horn and waddles his tail. You get up and promptly crouch down in front of Waddles and Gompers, placing your ring bearer part, playing your ring bear, bearer part very seriously. A glow stick ring goes onto one of Gompers' horns, and you place the other on Waddles' rear, hanging off his curly Q tail. I now pronounce you husband and husband. Duh, again. You may now kiss the goat. Waddles sniffs at Gompers and snorts. That definitely counts. Dipper reappears with the new camera, and Mabel throws more rose petals at him. A few gets stuck to his fluffy hat, and he rolls his eyes, but retaliates by taking a very close-up picture of the Flash temporarily blinding her. Hey, save the film for the renew renewedly- renewedly weds. <laughs> I, <laughs> I need plenty of pictures for my scrapbook. That's a good wordplay, I love that. Uh, you owe me a new camera for this, Mabel. He sounds annoyed, but his bond's pit- his fond sibling smile gives him away, and he starts taking pictures of the happy couple, getting odd angles as Mabel pushes them into silly poses. Goobers. You step away from the scene and go to head back into the house, being a ring bearer is thirsty work, but Stan and Ford stop you before you make it to the door. Hey, Tempest, thanks for playing along with Mabel with the whole wedding thing. We're both glad you're willing to entertain her whenever we're gone. She didn't, uh, make you do it, did she? Uh, she didn't. She needed a ring bearer, so I stepped up to help. <laughs> Stand and Ford arch matching brows at you. I'm very invested in the marriage of a goat and a pig, you know. Three of you laugh and stand past your shoulder. Ford gives you a warm smile. Well, I'm glad you're as into all that as she is. Thank you for that. Yeah, kid, it's nice of you to be uh, nice to her, you know. Yeah, why wouldn't I be? Stan clears his throat, awkwardly rubbing the back of his neck. Uh, uh, thanks for playing with Mabel and her weird wedding thing. Looks like she likes you. It's not hard, but still. He gives you a genuinely grateful smile that you easily return. It's no problem, really. I'm happy to keep her and Dipper happy where, where I can. Stan nods at you, pink in the cheeks, before going past you and heading into the house. You swear you give- you see Ford give him a funny look, but you could just be imagining it. Hey, Tempest, you're gonna miss the party. We got popsicles. I call the red ones. Pineapple ones are mine, I call dibs. But the pineapple ones are the best ones! Mabel and Stan wrestle over a yellow popsicle while Dipper continually unwraps a red one, holding it above his head and out of Gomper's way. Ford gingerly picks out a purple ice pop and leaves the ice chest open for you to grab one as well. <laughs> while Stan and Mabel aren't looking, you hide the pineapple popsicles at the bottom of the chest. Dipper sees and starts laughing, but doesn't tell. They're a strange bunch, these two sets of Pines twins, but they're certainly making your summer a lot more exciting as your stay at the Mystery Shack continues, your wreck of a car sitting outside in the heat of the setting sun. Cute. It's another day of summer with nothing to do but wait. Your schedule is surprisingly clear today. Stan usually has something going on for you to help with, and if not, Ford, Sue, or the kids do. What do you want to find? I want to find Stan. Um... You pass through the living room and Mabel spots you from her seat at the table. So I was hoping I'd see you. Come on, I want to ask you something. 
Mabel points at, down at the table with a raspberry pink colored pencil. Her art supplies scattered across the table lie across various sheets of paper with brightly colored doodles and lots of glitter. <laughs> this game is so cute. Oh, what was it? Uh, you see a drawing that looks like a cross between Barney and Godzilla, a page full of puppies, and a page with a drawing that looks kind of like you, with- is that Ford or Stan? Mabel's not finished with it yet, but the telltale jawline gives it away. She's so real for this, actually. <laughs> you sit at the table, across from Mabel. Suddenly you get the same feeling you get a job interview. It's intensified when she pushes her organized chaos papers aside and steeples her fingers over the table surface. Tempest, I'll be frank. I've been trying to find a match for my grunkles for a while, but I never seem to get their matches made. Sorry, a, a match? But then it's like you're pulled from thin air, attracted to the shack by a magnet of love. <laughs> it was a sign, and this week just made the chemistry you share with him obvious. You know who I'm talking about, right? He's Dan. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Grunglestan says he's not looking for love anymore, but I think he says that after every rejection. He's a romantic deep down. I can feel it. And you know what they say, even if you're not looking for it, love will find you no matter what. Love? That's a jump, to say the least. Well, you've certainly had enough time to form your opinion of Stan, and it's shifted and changed with every additional minute. He's got his own fair share of mysteries, and damn it, you're curious. There's plenty of potential there. I can see it in your face. You know what would really get this chemistry going? Or talking to him? <laughs> what? No. I'm thinking of something more romantic. Hold on, I'm getting an idea. I'll get everything ready, Tempest. You just focus on falling completely and utterly in love. Matchmaker Mabel is back in the game. Oh, there she goes. Just as you exit the talk with Mabel, you run into Dipper right outside the living room. And it doesn't seem like an accident, either. His arms are crossed, and he's looking at you dubiously. So, I heard about Mabel's plan. How do you- I just left the room. Yeah, well, word travels fast. And Mabel sends out mass te update text. His defense is- <clears throat> His defensive posture softens a bit. God, I can't read. <laughs> uh, just tell me one thing. I know my grunkles can look after themselves, but can you promise me you won't hurt Grunkle Stan? You can trust me. Okay, Tempest, I'm remembering that. The text notification sound and sounds and Dipper checks his phone. And be ready. Tomorrow afternoon? For your lakeside date with Grunkle Stan? Ugh, this was awkward enough. No offense, Tempest. Just my Grunkle Stan actually going on a date? Do old people even date? Kind of hard to wrap my head around. Hope Mabel doesn't ask me for my help tomorrow. I mean, I have enough trouble trying to date for myself. Mabel calls down from upstairs. Hey, Dip Top, I'm gonna need your help tomorrow. Well, never mind. <laughs> and now you head back to your room, ready to go to bed, but mentally still stuck on that interesting conversation earlier with Mabel. Mabel had already put her plan in motion over dinner. Turns out Stan had been planning to take the kids to the lake tomorrow to go fishing, and lucky you, Mabel managed to score you an invite. Waddles joins you surprisingly, and you have some fun petting his belly and taking pictures as a, as a distraction from your thoughts. It's almost like he knew something was up. Or did Mabel send him? Is he infiltrating your safety zone for intel? You decide not, laying back onto your mattress to try and relax. Waddle settles by your side, snuggling up. Thanks for the support, little buddy. Eventually you get tired of your phone and decide to close your eyes, but you just can't stop thinking about what Mabel said. Stan, a romantic? Is that what Mabel said? Yeah, right, no way. Maybe charming in his own way, sure, but... The type of guy to go on an actual date, planned by Mabel? What was Mabel planning, anyway? She might go for something fancy or formal. But Stan really seems in his element with the hands-on nitty-gritty stuff. Hopefully calling it a date won't ruin the natural thing you have going. You've, uh, your eyes finally close for good, feeling weighted down and heavy. You give Waddles a pat while you still can before slipping into unconsciousness. You slip out of a dream and back into your room in real life. The sky is light outside and you, and groggily you re feel regret as you realize Waddles', is, Waddles is covering wa comforting weight isn't there anymore. Blah, blah, blah. Aw. Wait, that's not what you're regretting. You're regretting the end of what you feel like was a really good dream. <laughs> it's 
Stan had taken you with him to the lake, you think, and somehow ended up in the water. Sunlight streamed down on him as he grinned at you, his white shirt sticking wet to skin. That'd be a date, all right, but it's the last thing you're expecting from today. Laughing quietly at yourself, you glance at the clock to see it's time to get ready for the day anyway. A little while later, you're dressed for a day at the lake, meaning dressed for a regular day of summer. You're not sure what to expect, so you kept it casual. You would have eaten breakfast with Stan and the kids, but you were barred from the kitchen by Mabel who was shielding you from a surprise. Said you were handed a slice of toast, topped with an oddly cheerful sunny side up egg, and waved outside. Now that you're out in the sunlight, you can see that Mabel stuck a smiley face sticker on top of the egg. Gross. You peel it off with a shrug and dig in. I would never. I would just not eat it. I'm sorry. Leaning against the scarlet door of the El, Di Del the 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 El Diablo, you stare up at the totem pole outside the shack, thinking about how it stands out, both stands out and fits perfectly in with the shack's aesthetic. It's obviously part of the weirdness of the tourist shop, but you're not sure why. It looks pretty well made, even if it's kind of creepy that whenever you move your eyes, whenever you move, the eyes at the top seem to follow you. Suddenly, the front door bursts open, and a flurry of sequins and glittery hair clips fly flies out, attached to a very excited Mabel. Tempest, are you ready? Not spying any conspiratory uh, nudges or winks, so you kind of think Mabel's dropped the whole date setup thing, at least for the moment. For what? Fishing? Yeah, aren't you excited? This isn't just regular lake fishing, this is Lake Gravity Falls fishing, where adventure awaits, danger is hot on your heels, and the island shifts and moves in, in the corner of your, of your eyes. The, I'm, I'm sorry, the what move? Are we talking about Scuttlebutt Island? I love telling that one. So we were out on the shore, right? And we saw this giant... Hey, you kids better not be giving that Tempest that lake monster story again. Stan comes out of the shack with several fishing rods in the crook of his arm, as well as a large tackle box in his right hand. In his other hand are four fishing hats with haphazardly embroid em haphazard embroidery on the front of the two of them. Aw, a closer look reveals that they're actually names such onto the hats, reading Mabel and Dippy. Funko Stan... Oops. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, you don't have to pretend not to believe us anymore. I swear, it really happened. It just rose right out of the water and started chasing us. We had to row back as fast as we could, and it was speaking creepy monster language, and... What did I say? No more of that monster talk, or you're gonna scare Tempest away. Both kids look a little disappointed, but leave it at that. Stan puts on a smile and drops Dipper and Mabel's respective fishing hats on their heads, and Mabel tugs hers on while running to the car while Dipper follows, exchanging his usual hat for the fishing one. Stan looks out after them, then turns to face you. Eh, kids love to exaggerate. Pretty sure it wasn't that terrifying. Size, I've been through worse. You hear that, kids? Only your Grunkle Stan's got the right to complain. Stan hefts his fishing supplies over to one arm, using the other to dig around in his pocket for the car keys. Tosses the rods, hats, and tackle box inside. Mabel's hand darts in before Stan can close the trunk, grabbing a hat. Hold on. Um, grabbing a hat. Before you can tell what it says, it's shoved into your hands and you smooth out the fabric to read Tempest. And groans. Mabel, I thought I told you I wasn't going to give it to him. But you worked so hard stitching it this morning. You even got the letters the right way on. No, mostly. Oh. Mabel gets in the back seat next to Dipper, leaving you to look at the hat more closely. Sewing is a little messy one of the letters is backwards, but Stan clearly put some amount of care into it. Thinking of Stan, he's staring at Ma the hat Mabel shoved at you, thinking of something to say. Did you really make this for me? Stan scratches the back of his head and shrugs a little. Yeah, Mabel wouldn't let me leave until I made you one. Said it was nicer if all of us had matching hats or something. I'm gonna immediately put it back on. You put it on and beam at Stan. He doesn't respond, just re reaches up and closes the trunk, but you s see he looks almost too privately pleased to give comment. He's cutie! Come on, let's get to the lake for all those tourists take the good parking spots. The parking lot is far less packed than Sam made it out to be. The weather 
brought out the true fishing fanatics, and he recognized a few customers from the Saks gift shop milling about. There are a couple clouds out, but the sunshine is warm against your skin as you step out of the car. You shield your eyes from the light as you look out over the lake. A few boats bobbing up and down in the blue-gray water sport telltale signs of fellow fishers with poles sticking out over the boat's edges. But some people are just relaxing in the water. Families sit on beach towels and sunbathe, and you spot a couple kids standing in line for a hot dog stand. For a small town, this place is pretty lively. Mabel and Dipper run out to the shore, where a splash from Mabel soon devolves the moment in into a contest of who can splash wor who worst. You grin at them in their laughter, but the quiet grunt from behind you catches your attention. Left to get everything out of the trunk, Stan struggles to get the fishing equipment out without dropping anything. Offer to help him carry poles. Hey, need some help? Stan glances up at you. It's really not that much, you know. Not even a couple poles? Stan considers this for a moment, then hands you two of the four fishing poles. Think you can hold your own? What, under the crushing weight of a couple fishing poles? I think I can manage. You hear Mabel's voice from the distance away to the shore. Truce, truce, hold on, I've got a phone call. You see Mabel taking out her cell phone as Dipper takes the opportunity to, ring, to start ringing out parts of his shirt. Uh-huh, okay. I'll be there in five. Bye, Brenda. Mabel hangs up and rushes to you and Stan. Uncle Stan, I'm really, really sorry, but emergency is happening right now as we speak. What, is somebody dying? No, the opposite, a birth thing. <laughs> Grunda Jr. is having a baby right now, and Grunda needs me there for motherly support. Grunko Stan, you gotta let me go. Stan scratches his head and frowns. I don't know, sweetie. I thought we were all gonna go fishing today. Can't she hold it in? Isn't that a thing that happens? No. No, no, Stan. No, that... Okay. Nope, and it's not every day I get to see the wonders of iguana childbirth. Grunko Stan, please. Mabel gives him those patented pump... Mabel pumpy... Puppy eyes. Stan lets out a heavy sigh, shakes his head, and smiles. All right, Pumpkin, go on. I know your friend is waiting for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mabel uh, wraps her arms around Stan's waist and gives him a strong hug, her wide grin never faltering. She then lets go and grabs Dis Dipper's wrist before dashing off. I'm taking Dipper for moral support. Wait, I didn't agree to this. Mabel! Mabel! I thought lizards hatched trimmed eggs. Thought so too, but hell, I've seen weirder. Best not to question it, kid. Before you delve too deeply into the thought of live birth lizards, your phone buzzes in your pocket. You pull it out, and it's a text from Mabel. Hi, Tempest. I fixed you. <laughs> I fixed you up so that you get a whole day with Grunkle Stan. Have fun. Oh shoot, I gotta go. Grenda says Grenda is getting closer to baby time. See ya. That clever little devil. Is something wrong? Nah, just Mabel saying she's gonna send lots of pictures of, of the newborn lizard. Well, come on, let's get to fishing before it gets dark out. Yippee! Towards the end of the first pier, docked with only a frayed length of rope, is a sad looking dinghy with the word Stan of War brushed on in thick black paint. You notice know a small rusting motor on the stern that looks as if it's going to fall apart at any moment. It looks what looks like a hastily made patch on the side. There's no thing way this thing is watertight. Stan sets, sets the two to poles down inside, along with the tackle box and gestures at the boat. Well, there she is. A beauty, ain't she? Uh, uh, well, you look at Stan, then back at the boat, then back at him. It's a bit small, don't you think? Stan crosses his arms. What, you saying you got a problem with my boat? Uh, no, it's, it's just... Where are we going to put the massive amounts of fish we're about to catch? Stan laughs at that, his expression brightening. Ha! Huh, optimistic, I like it. I'm going to reel in so much fish it'll be coming out your ears, Stanley Pines. Alright, hotshot, I'll hold you to that. Uh, Stan climbs down into the boat first and offers you his hand to steady yourself as you follow him down. The boat wobbles a little, swaying dangerously away from your body, but Stan's grip is firm and you're able to get into the, in the boat without incident. Whoa there, careful now. Wouldn't want you getting wet before we even started. The footing's a little tricky, see? That plank has a habit of moving and tipping this boat the whole way over. And when that happens, you want to swing your weight over here. Okay, no, I'm getting out. Stan chuckles heartily, making it clear that he was joking. In your relief, you notice that he's still holding your hand from the assist earlier. 
I'm just messing with you. Don't worry, you're not gonna get wet tits. You're in good hands. And this uh, isn't the only fishing vessel I own. The other one's bigger, called the Stan Award 2. Creative. Hey, I'm not joking this time. I got pictures. Hold on, and you quit standing. Take a seat. Don't want you losing your balance. You sit and watch as Stan digs out his wallet and opens it. It's so full of photos that several come free, fluttering down to the floor of the boat. As you pick them up, you see that the pictures of Seuss, the kids, and a teenager you've been told is Wendy. This is a Stan Award too. Stan hands you an unfolded photo, which depicts him and Ford standing proudly on the deck of a comparatively larger, newer, and safer-looking vessel that, than the one you're in now. It's docked in a place you don't recognize, and the sky is bright blue and cloudless. She's a resilient one, sailed all over, and never let me down once. Well, until me and Ford came back to Oregon. Then, poof, she sputtered out, and we had to send her in for repairs. Something about sailing in extreme environments. Point is, I'm back down with Stan of War Mark I over here. The old girl's got her qu quirks, but she's reliable. I'm guessing this one needs fixing pretty often. Yeah, she's just like my El Diablo. Every time I broke down, I just fixed it up again. Learned real quick what to do and what not to do under the hood. He chuckles to himself and dusts off his hands before presenting his outstretched palm to you. See that big scar right across my palm? I told the kids I got it fighting off a big grizzly bear. Heh, <laughs> you should have seen the looks on their faces. Thought I was some kind of hero, you know? But, uh, the real story is I burned it out the engine when I was 16. Must have thought I was hot stuff trying to change the oil while the car was running. Oh my god, were you alright? That must have been so painful. And my pops called me an idiot for thinking the engine wasn't hot. But my ma cleaned me up in the end. You remember you're still holding his photos and you hand them all back, which he returns to his wallet with some difficulty. Hey, does that wallet just carry photos or does it hold money from time to time? Stan chuckles at your teasing. Nah, I just keep a lot of photos in there to remember. Keeps me grounded. Oh. Anyways, let's get the show on the road. Stan turns, busying himself with cranking the motor, and with it, with a few pulls, it sput sputters to life, expelling a thick plume of exhaust. He coughs and attempts to wave it away quickly. Stan gives the motor a couple good thumps, and it quits coughing, the engine smoothing out into a much gentler thrum. From there, he's back to focusing on untying the boat from the pier and easing it out into the open water of the lake. Yippee. Glancing around, you spot the two policemen from your night in the clink, and you quickly duck out of sight, hoping to avoid being seen. Stan turns his head and notices you crouch in the bottom of the boat and quirks an eyebrow. You hiding from the sun or something? No, it's those two cops from a few days ago. Stan whips his head around, spots them, and lets out a laugh so loud it startles you. Who, Bloves and Durland? Oh, I told you, those two are harmless. Besides, I think today they're a little more focused on each other than us. No. Oh. Uh, you peek your head up over the edge of the boat, just enough to check out Stan's claim. Sure enough, the two cops seem to be engrossed only in each other, laughing and applying sunscreen to each other's skin. It's cute, you think. And a relief that they're not on the lookout to arrest you and Stan again. Well, thank goodness, that was way too cold to go back into. Stan gives you a nod of agreement at opening the tackle box. There's a bunch of colorful lures inside, a few hooks, and some spare string for the poles. He motions for you to, to hand him your pole, and within moments he's got a hook tied to the end of your line. You a live bait or lure kind of person? Uh, I like lures. Ah, gotcha. I'm a live bait man myself, but I bet I can swing you over to my side in no time. I just don't like touching worms. <laughs> Sam picks out a feathered lure from the tackle box and attaches it to the end of your line. Then hands you back your pole. The two of you settle into the relative quiet. As you wait for a bite, you look out over the lake, lake at the other people outside today. Whether because he noticed or whether he was just filling, filling the lull in conversation, Stan starts pointing out faces of the locals, putting names to them, giving you a little background on each person. You quickly realize that the background info he gives has too much of his opinion mixed in to be useful, but you try to remember the names anyway. Still, time passes easily and you soon find yourself reeling in quite a few catches of your own. Uh, looking over at Stan, you've clearly managed to catch more, but he dismisses the difference with the excuse that his luck's just waiting to kick in any moment now. Seriously, any moment. He clears up the lake for a minute, then lets it go, leaning back with a sigh. <sighs> I think it's time for a water break, don't you? Trying to distract me so you'll gain the advantage? Hey, if you faint out here, that's not gonna be on me, kid. You want a bottle or not? Okay, okay, toss me one, would you? Stan leans down and digs around in the bottom of the boat towards th the the bow and uh 
comes away with two bottles of water wet with condensation. He smiles and tosses you the bottle, and you catch it, twisting off the cap and taking a grateful sip. Until now, you hadn't realized how thirsty you actually were. Santa takes out his own bottle and starts chugging the water, clearly more thirsty than you are. <laughs> Some of the water slips past the opening and drips down his chin onto a shirt, darkening the fabric. Your palms suddenly feel very sweaty and you can't look away. Y'all, I can't play this. <laughs> uh, Santa notices you staring and swallows, taking the bottle away and licking the stray moisture off his lips. Your eyes both mean, for a long moment you both just stare at each other, neither daring to take a breath. Stan licks his lips again, almost uh, slow this time, almost deliberately so. A uh, sound of a boat motor breaks the silence and you whip your head around just in time to see a speedboat tear past you at a speed that's definitely illegal for a lake as small as this one. You have half a mind to sh share a very rude gesture to the driver, but suddenly Stan is grabbing your hand and shouting, Look out! Because the massive weight created in the speedboat's wake is headed in your direction. It slams into the dinghy and rocks it off balance, tipping it dangerously to one side before dumping you both out into the water, fish and all. The water is cold, almost bitterly so for being in the middle of summer, and despite surfacing nearly instantly, you're already soaked and shivering. The poles, tackle box, and fish are long gone, and the boat floats upturned some distance to your right. You swim over to it and grip on onto the curved underbelly, gasping for air. You hear Stan spluttering behind you, making his way to the boat. He's yelling at the offending boat, using some very colorful terms you've never heard before, but make a mental note to remember later for posterity. Once he makes it to the stand of war, he sags heavily against the wood, taking a deep, measured breath. He, too, is completely soaked, and his wet shirt clings tightly to his body. As his chest heaves, you can't help but look your fellow, and then pretend to be very invested in scanning the lake for the two policemen when Stan looks your way. Well, that's one disaster of a fishing trip. <laughs> you can say that again. Stan lets out a disappointed groan and starts pulling off his jacket before tossing it on the upturned boat. What are we going to tell Dipper and Mabel that their old uncle's lost his fishing touch? Huh, you wish I could outfish you any day. I'd like to see you try, old man. Old man, why I oughta... He splashes water on you and you shriek and mock outrage before a wicked grin fills your face. I want to dunk him. Go big or go home, as the saying goes. You show Stan under the water for a brief moment, and he comes up coughing and spitting water. Less thrilled than you initially hoped. What are you trying to do, kid? Kill me? Oh, I messed up, guys. The sound of an air horn led by Durlin saves you from the awkward moment, and you breathe a sigh of relief knowing you're about to be rescued. The ride back to the shore is a quiet one, and you take the opportunity to start wringing water out of the hem of your shirt. Everything smells like briny lake water and you wrinkle your nose at the scent. Definitely not the most glamorous end to a fishing trip, you think. The walk back to the car is slow and methodical, a relief after the adrenaline rush you just had a little while ago. Stan is wringing out his jacket, muttering under his breath about damaging good Moroccan leather when a sudden and violent cold chill runs through your body. Despite the warmth of the sun, your soaked clothes and clammy skin skin from the water all catch up at once and you start shivering. Oh, jeez. Uh, here, take my jacket. Before you can protest, Stan is draping his jacket around your shoulders. It's Stan, but you're somehow immediately surrounded by a sense of warmth, and your chills subside just a little bit. Somehow, despite having taken a dunk in the lake along with the rest of him, the jacket smells good. It's got a faint wood woodsy smell to it, a hint of smokiness. It takes everything in you not to bury your nose into the thick of it. While you're busy taking in the, in the jacket, Stan hops into the driver's seat and has the El Diablo cranked and running in a flash. Need a ride back? Stan, you are my ride. I know, I'm just teasing you. He reaches across the bench seat and opens the passenger door, motioning for you to come inside. Come on, let's get back to the shack. It's a lot warmer in, in here than out there, you know. Stan flicks on the radio once you're cruising down the road, and a good song comes on, one you both know the words to. Stan is humming along quietly, and you pretend not to notice, not wanting to ruin a good thing. The breeze from the open windows is calming, and as the trees whiz by, you don't regret getting soaked anymore. It's not long before Stan pulls up to the shack and shuts off the El Diablo, and you both exit the car. Your limbs crack and pop from exertion, and only now do you realize just how exhausted you feel from the day's adventure. Man, you'd kill for a nice, warm, dry bed right about now. Hey, Tempest, I, uh... Stan halts for a moment and scratches the back of his head nervously. He's looking at the ground, shuffling his feet back and forth, trying to find the right words to say. Oh. I feel kind of bad about getting y'all soaked today. 
I I promised you'd be in good hands, and then everything went right to hell in a handbasket, didn't it? Stan, it's fine, really. Do you like campfires? What? I asked if you like campfires. Uh, yes. Great, hold on, I'll be just a few minutes. You're left confused and standing in the backyard of the shack as Stan dashes inside, slamming the door shut as he goes. Chill breeze whips through the trees and you shiver. Despite Stan's jacket, you're still a little damp, and being exposed like this certainly doesn't help matters. You check your phone, and after several minutes are ready to give up and head inside the shack, when Stan comes back, comes to the back door, arms full of marshmallows? Come here, I want to show you something. Curious, you follow him over to what appears to be a makeshift fire pit. There's already wood and kindling inside, and part of you wonders if Stan always keeps firewood lying around, or if he prepared this just for you. He pulls a book of matches from his pocket and strikes a match, the head bursting into bright yellow flame. He tosses it into the wood pile, where gradually the kindling ignites. It's not long before you have a modest but warm fire at your feet. I figure you're still pretty damp, and I'm sure you're hungry as hell since we didn't catch any fish, so... He trails off and gestures at the fire and the marshmallows again. It's the least I could do for screwing up your day. Stan. This is wonderful. This is wonderful, Stan. I thank you so much. Stan blushes just a little from the praise. You can not You can tell he wasn't expecting it with that much sincerity. Well, it's Chuck's. I'm glad you like it. You're not sure how long he sat up by the fire, roasting marshmallows over the open flame. Stan's burned his mouth more times than you can count trying to eat a marshmallow far too soon. And you've burned enough of the tree to make... Even the Stay Puffed Man weep. <laughs> Stan plucks another marshmallow out of the bag and turns it over in his fingers a few times like he's contemplating something before turning back to face you. You ever played catch with these? Huh? I mean, toss them up and try to catch them again with your mouth. Yeah, who doesn't do that? Hey, I thought I'd ask. You never know with some people these days. Suddenly a grin spreads across his lips and he tosses the marshmallow up in the air straight towards you. Catch. Uh, you lean back and open your mouth just in time for the marshmallow to sail, sail right through your lips and into your mouth. You bite down, chewing it with a triumphant grin. Victory has never tasted sweeter. Suddenly the back door flies open and out come Dipper and Mabel running up to the campfire excitedly. They're both in pajamas but look wide awake as ever and already, are already snatching up the marshmallow bag to dig in. Are those marshmallows? Come on, Google Stan, why didn't you tell us you were roasting marshmallows? Because you should be in bed, bed pumpkin, that's why. He ruffles Mabel's hair affectionately and pulls her into his lap, handing her his roasting stick. Nope, we're teenagers now. Teenagers don't have bedtimes. Yeah, exactly, so Grunkle Stan. Answer still no, kid. You cannot go on the three-day camping trip to track ghost prints. But Grunkle Ford supports my theory. If you ask me, your Grunkle Ford needs a bedtime, too. So how was the live lizard birth? Oh, it was so exciting. Grinda Jr. was so relaxed, he didn't even realize Grin Grinda Jr. Extreme was being born before her very eyes. And then, wait, Dipper, you tell him the rest. Uh, why don't you keep telling it? I didn't get a great look. But I gave you a front row seat right next to me. You saw the whole thing up close. Intimately. Unforgettably. Dipper shivers, and not from the chill of the night air. Okay, fine. So Grinda Jr. Extreme imprinted on Dipper. Isn't that the cutest thing? Little dipped off a mom. No, it's not. And I'm not little. I'm, I'm manly. You and Stan chuckle at the kids' antics and give each other knowing glances as you each pop another marshmallow into your mouths. The fire crackles and you draw Stan's jacket further around yourself, feeling truly warm for the first time today. It is actually working out. Yippee. I don't know if we're actually going to finish it today with how low the love meter is. It's a new day and you wake up early, grasped with the desire to go outdoors. You decide breakfast for for one doesn't sound too bad, and maybe a walk. Gracie's isn't too far, and the food there is pretty good. You'll be back before anyone even knows you're gone. To bend against the morning chill, you pull on Stan's jacket, which you haven't yet returned from yesterday. You didn't see him when he got up, so it wouldn't hurt to wear it one more time, would it? When you arrive at Gracie's diner, you're immediately greeted with the scent of fresh coffee and sizzly bacon. Looking around at the other diners, you'd guess this is the breakfast rush. Of course, in a small town like this, that means about a dozen other people are here. Uh, you've only been in Gravity Falls a week, but you're starting to learn some of the names, and Stan's refresher yesterday helped some, too. That big, uh, burly guy over there with the bushy red beard is... You're start struggling to recall his name. Let's see, it was... Dan. Hey, Dan. Huh? Hey, you're the tourist staying with the pines. My kids are off somewhere else, so I got an open seat if you need it. 
Could be nice to talk with someone other than the pines for once. Well, fun, their hijinks can get tiring, even for you. Mm, yeah, sit with them, why not? Take a seat on the empty stool next to Dan. Lazy Susan, the waitress, comes over from behind the counter. What can I get you to drink? Just water. Sure thing, I'll have it right out for you. You notice she doesn't take Dan's order. Nice jacket. Thanks, uh, Stan Pines loaned it to me. Yeah, half the town noticed that yesterday. <laughs> oh, you hadn't realized it was that public. It was that public. Splash sent a lot of fish swimming my way, though, so thanks. Does word always move that quick around here? You worried about that now? People in town were already talking before that. You just gave them more to talk about. What were they saying? He shrugs. If a slab of solid stone could shrug. I don't listen to gossip. Gossip happens to come to my ears. Lazy Susan comes back out with your drink, as well as a hot cup of coffee for Manly Dan. You figured he ordered it before you sat down. Uh, you watch as Dan lifts the steaming mug of coffee to his mouth, but then chugs the whole thing. It seem looks like an instant recipe for a second-degree burn, but surprisingly, almost sickeningly, he seems relieved by it. He's starting to realize why this guy has such a tough guy reputation. He sighs, putting the now-empty mug back down, and turns to you. What were we talking about? I seriously can't remember. I'll get you a refill. You ready to order, sweetie? Me? Oh yeah, can I have the... Egg and bacon! Uh, she leaves, and you and Dan are left to sit in silence. What do you want, Morgan? Hold on, my bestie is messaging me. Me bestie. Anyways, uh, ask about Stan. What do you know about Stan Pines? Real con artist type, not a friend of mine. But as long as Wendy's getting paid out of his pocket, I don't care either way. Doesn't matter what I say, though. Looks like you already know what to think of him. Ask him about his family. So tell me some more about your family. Wendy's my oldest. Then there's the three boys, Marcus, Kevin, and Gus. Huh, he didn't mention a spouse. Don't ask. Not our business. Four kids, huh? <laughs> That's a lot. But I'm tough enough. They don't call me Manly Dan for nothing. He grins and flexes his muscles and winks. You think you saw him wink. Ask him about his order. She didn't take your order. I'm a regular. Pancakes and hot black coffee, as like usual. Lazy Susan comes back over to the counter, setting your plate down in front of you. She gives Man Manly Dan a big sack of pancakes and a refill on his coffee. He gives a minute nod to his plate. Like I said. The conversation comes to an end as the immediate allure of food takes priority. He finishes far faster than you do and looks out the window, squinting at the angle the light makes with the trees. It's time for me to hit the road. Nice to meet you. He goes to the register, pays for his meal, and jogs out of the diner. As he leaves, Lazy Fus Susan comes back over. She leans against the counter, giving you a smile. So, stranger, I've been seeing you around here with the pines and haven't even had a chance to talk to you yet. Mind if I stay for a bit? Not at all. Um, ask her about Stan. Do you know Stanley Pines? She laughs. Who doesn't? Oh, he's a real charmer. Such a handsome fella. We almost had something once, but it didn't work out. It's so strange. I called him every night. So how are things going with him? Uh, what? You two look close. Saw you on the lake while I was fi fishing for dinner. But he's the real catch of the day, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> Laughing, Lazy Susan elbows you companion companionably, but you're speechless. She winds down with a sigh. Am I right? I'm right. <laughs> As you the town. So how long have you lived in Gravity Falls? Well, my whole life. Besides what happened last summer, it's always been a nice town. Nice people and nice food, right? Yeah, it's great, but uh, what happened last summer? You don't mind me asking? Oh, well, never mind all that. Ask about the diner. So are you the owner? Oh, gosh, no, I'm just a waitress. Been here ever since I was a teenager. Me and Matilda have been the only waitresses here for years, but we've had a promising new trainee working here since the spring. She points out the window to where a blonde girl around Mabel's age is shooing a raccoon away from the diner's trash cans. Lazy Susan puts her hands on her hips with pride. We're starting her out small. Woodpecker's next. Well, I better get back to work. It's nice to meet you, Tempest. Enjoy your breakfast. 
And you do, digging back into your breakfast with gusto until your meal is again interrupted, and this time by the buzzing of your phone from inside your pocket. Huh, it's a call from a number you don't recognize. Pick it up. Maybe this one won't be from a tele telemarketer. Hello? This Tempest? Wait, Stan? Yeah, it's me. Look, I've got a surprise waiting for you back at the shack. Think you can get back over here from wherever you are? The surprise sounds intriguing, so you promise to be there after breakfast. It's not long until you finish up, pay for your food, and head out the door. So you approach the shack, you sp spot Stan already outside. Hey, I was about to call again to make sure you didn't get lost. You plan this sort of timing, or what? Comes naturally. Well, that's the thing you wanted to show me. You'll see. Just follow me. Stan leads you to a room in the back of the shack that you remember being used mostly as a storage space. Now that the furniture has been pushed aside and boxes have been stacked against the wall to make room for what looks like... A boxing ring? Looks ragtag, hand-constructed, and distinctly homemade. You pulled this together just this morning? I tried putting this together last night after everyone went to bed. I was admiring my new... clone egg? Again, thinking about our drive last week, and I remembered I wanted to show you how to throw a better punch. Stan shrugs, casual, as though he hadn't already put loads of work into what he's prepared for you. So what do you think? You ready to learn how to hit? Yes, absolutely. Whoa, someone's eager. He grins, though, relieved, and it's like a weight came off his shoulders. Did he think he might have said no? Well, here... Uh, from his pocket, he pulls out a roll of what looks like gauze tape. Before we even do anything, you gotta wrap your, hand wrap your hands properly. You can get hurt otherwise. He takes one of your hands in his, looping the tape around your thumb and winding it around your wrist, then up around your hand, wrapping it snugly. He pulls the tape between and through your fingers as they rest on his palm. His hand is warm, the warmth seeping, in, seeping into yours as he holds it. It's faint, but you can feel the roughness of his palm and, and you watch as he works, confident but careful. It shouldn't affect you as much as it does. You should feel neutral, grateful, nothing more, but when it's him and the two of you are nearly face to face, the act holds an undeniable intimacy. He pulls the tape back around your thumb and then around your knuckles expertly. It feels tight. No, not tight, secure. Stan finishes wrap the wrap at the wrist, and you watch him pull the tape towards his mouth. Clenching it between his teeth, he jerks his head to sever it. The remainder is then wrapped back around, snug and complete, when Stan smiles down at his work. He doesn't look up at you yet, but if he had, he would have been embarrassed by the expression that's on your face. Other hand, now. Uh, you offer your other hand, and he starts on it, same as before. This time, you watch the act less, and watch the look in his eyes more. It's his focus, you find, and care underneath it. You can see it in every pull and twist of the tape, a conviction to protect, to secure. You're so lost in the sight that before you know it, he's done and looking at you again. Alright, not too tight, is it? N nope But let me show you how you should be standing. Standing? Is there something wrong with your posture right now? Stan starts giving some explanation, but the moment he steps up to you and places the hand at small your back to guide you, the words lose their meaning. You don't want to be too stiff, you see? He directs you, smoothing out the line of your shoulders, widening your stance, placing guiding hands to show you how you, sh you should be positioning yourself. He's talking again, but you're more than a little distracted. And that's why we do that. Make sense? Y yeah. Good. Now on to punching. I've got some personal experience with the way you hit. I already apologized for that. And it could use a lot of work. Kid, I'm telling you, I barely felt it. Here's how to direct that strength. He demonstrates, moving to your right to assume the same stance he's guided you into and swinging through empty air. Does it again, slower this time for him to explain how to shift your weight, where to start from, and where to go. Then it's your turn, and after a couple swings of your own, the hands-on guidance is back. Stan's hand for hands first resting briefly at your waist to adjust the twist of your torso, go next to your shoulders, nudging you into a better balance. Then he corrects the movement of your arms, and his chest is warm at your back as he reaches, um, reaches to show you where to go. Your breath catches. Yes, there. Damn, you almost had it. Try again. Come back here and... Um, actually, I think it'd help if I, um, had something to hit. Sure, we can... Uh, Tempest, you sure you want to go on? You're looking kind of red. Yeah, about that, bestie. The unexpected intimacy is a little overwhelming right now, and he's still so close to you. Especially after what you'd heard at the diner today, that whatever you had with him is obvious. It has you a little on edge. I'm fine. You've put the whole room together. We haven't even used it yet. We should. For that, you're gonna need these. He holds up a pair of standard, albeit a bit old, boxing gloves, handing them to you. You have some trouble putting them on. They're a little big. Hold on, let me do it. I'll lace them up for you. Takes your hand again, like earlier, pulling the laces of the glove tighter and tighter until the fit is snug. Is that too tight? N no, that's fine. Ties it off and takes your other hand, curling in his own for a moment before his hands move up, brushing along your wrist. 
He pulls the laces together, and as he does, you steal a look at his face. There's that same focus, that same care. The longer you stare, the more you feel heat rushing to your face, turning it red. How about that? It feels uh, perfect. He looks up and his eyes lock with yours. He looks away, clearing his throat with a gruff cough, and he knows now it's his face that's pink. Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> he's cute. He's a cutie. We should uh, get started. Nice to see you aren't the only one affected. Uh, as you watch Dan quickly wrap his own hands with a lingering blush on his face. He pulls on a pair of fingerless gloves next and wash it, walks into the makeshift ring. You're gonna try and land a hit on me, alright? What, you're just gonna stand there and let me hit you? Stan laughed, shaking his head. You think I'd make it that easy on you, Tempest? No, I'm gonna be hitting back. Of course, I'm not gonna let any of my hits land, but it'll stall you enough to make it a challenge. Remember what I showed you, jab, swing, and block. Putting him in action is just the next step. Boxing's pretty simple when you get down to it, but it's all in the timing. You need to know what the, the other person in the ring is thinking. It's almost... It's like it's almost like a dance. Uh, the other person in the ring, even though you're up against each other, they're just as much as your partner as they are your opponent. Even though you're going head-to-head, -head, you have to be willing to get intimate with them. Knowing the right moves at the right time and in the right place, you wind up forming a bond with your opponent. You nod and step up to join him in the ring. Where did you learn so much about boxing? Well, uh... When we were kids, my brother and I had a little rough. We weren't too popular with the other kids in the neighborhood. So our old man put us through boxing lessons. He wanted us to be tougher. My brother couldn't quite take to it. Not exactly. Poindexter could ace the lessons, same as how he was good as anything he put that big old brain towards, but he quit the first chance he could. But me? <laughs> what else did I have going for me, you know? Uh, if anything, I had to be tough enough to protect him, to keep us all safe. Always gotta be the tough one. Always have been. It's hard, but sooner or later, you forget what it's like not to have to feel tough. So I guess you could say it gets easier. After Ford and I... After I left home, I was on the road for a bit. Got into my fair share of trouble that followed me wherever I went. But I was fine. I was tough enough. I knew how to fight. Got me far enough, didn't it? It's gotten me through all these years. Here I am with you. Stan's eyes seem to glisten, but he looks away before you can tell for sure. He smiles with that big, ridic ridiculous grin as though to reassure you. He fakes a cough and wipes at his nose. Jeez, so dusty back here. We might as well get started already, huh? You probably don't want to listen to me rambling all day. Like I said, timing is key. Is, is it the time to make that big swing? Or will, will we be able to block it? Sometimes it's smarter just to take a quick jab. Even if you don't hit that hard, being quick enough to wear your partner down and keeping him blocked is enough to get you there. So let's dance. Oh my god, what? No, I actually have to do this? Holy shit, okay. <laughs> oh no. Okay, uh, a jab is faster than a block and does one damage. A swing does three damage, but is stopped by a block. If another opponent blocks, both his will succeed. Slow and steady, right? This should wear him down eventually. Stan doesn't look like he's tiring out anytime soon. Let's go ahead and block. B. Stan doesn't look like he's tying out anytime soon. Do another jab. Oh my god. Swing at him. Swing again. Block this time. See if you match. You can feel your confidence rising. Block again in case he decides to swing. Yeah! Swing at him now. Oh my god. Swing again. Stan's panting by now, sweat sh shining on his forehead and collarbone. Alright, alright, I'm calling it. Stan laughs. It's been too long since I had a decent fight. <laughs> you were great. You laugh too. The two of you lock eyes again and there it is, that warmth, that redness. You're both covered in sweat, out of breath, and even though you're both exhausted, you still pick up on a light in his eyes and eagerness. There's something here that's waiting to break in this moment of eye contact. Breaking the silence, you decide to be the first to act this time. You know what? I think... I think I'd love to dance with you sometime. Yeah, we should do this again. Definitely. 
But I mean, I think I'd really like to dance with you in a more literal sense, too. Not as opponents, but together, you and me. He hope he feels this too, this connection, this chemistry you have. It can't just be you. Breath is held nervous, and while it feels like time sits still in the pl space at that pause, just a second later, Stan breathes in and then he speaks. I like that, you know? I'd really like that. He's smiling in a way that lights up his face like you haven't seen before. He's smiling too, wide and goofy, full of a sheer giddiness he can't contain. There's something intoxicating about it. With that feeling running through you, it's a hard fall back to Earth. Hey, uh... Can you help me get these gloves off? Stan laughs loud and free and obliges. Later that day, just after dinner, when you get around telling Stan about your time at the diner. So I guess I'm asking, is it always like that around here? People talking about my love life? <laughs> after you said right for by Mabel, everyone else is a small fry. Uh, there's not much to talk about in this town, so when a tourist crashes their car into the jewel of the town at the peak of the season, that's prime material. Enough of that, though. I thought we could have a private movie night, you know? To wind down a little, keep movies in that cabinet over there. Go ahead and p go on and pick one. Uh, you open it up to reveal stacks of VHS tapes and a few DVDs. What do you want to watch? Horror film. Um, you pick out a creepy movie about a bizarre swamp creature attacking a bunch of teens at a summer camp. Towards the climax, the teens knock the monster into the lake with a harpoon gun they stole off the quartermaster's fishing boat. Just as it seems as though the fishing man is gone for good, the creature's hand bursts up out of the water. You yelp, startled by the cheap jump scare, and Stan chuckles. Slightly embarrassed, despite it totally not being your fault that your basic instincts are attacked, you bury your face into Stan's chest. He seems uncertain for a moment, awkwardly patting you on the back and clearing his throat. Uh, hey there, it's alright. The flashback already showed how it's gonna end. They still can't look. Gruesome sounds continue from the TV, and Stan slowly eases the padding into an embrace. <laughs> the film continues, checking cliche after cliche off the list. Stupidly, when making your selection, you hadn't accounted for the one, one of the most prevalent tropes of all. It's the final pair of surviving teenagers, believing they defeated the monster that's killed all their friends, begin making out furiously in triumph, you guess? It's disgusting, really, with hands everywhere and unrealistic noises filling the quiet night of the camp and subsequently the living room. You can hear Stan's heartbeat stutter in his chest, and he coughs awkwardly into his fist. You dare not to make eye contact, but instead lifting your head and shifting away from him. Such a suddenly is too much, and you thank the darkness of the room for hiding the redness of your face. Trying to wait it out, you silently cross your fingers that the couple will get killed off any minute now. Oh god. But instead, someone's pants start to come off, and your brain jolts you to your feet. <laughs> well, it's getting really late. Just get the hay. Yeah, I agreed. Stan shuts the film off, and in the light of the monitor, you can see his face is slightly red, too. He doesn't seem mad or upset, so you relax a little, slowing down enough to take a calming breath. There's no use of being so nervous. And thank you again for the lessons today. My arms are sore, so I assume that means it's working. He, g he grins, giving your shoulder a nice pat. Oh, definitely. Let me know in the morning if you still are. Uh, I got some old tricks that could help. Good night, Stan. Night, Tempest. It's just not going up. Snort, snort. What in the... When you open your eyes, you're being stared down by a wet, fat, wet snout. Ah! Oink. Ah, oh, Waddle sits you. The plump pig is lying on your chest, and boy, he's a real hefty. Tempest! Ah! You jolt up at the sudden voice from above you, sending waddles falling from your chest into your lap with a scree. You turn to see Mabel, a metal-filled smile on rosy cheeks, barely able to contain her glee despite nearly scaring the life out of you. Hey there, sleepyhead, it's lunchtime. Is it? What happened to breakfast? Glance at your phone until you just let them pass noon. Instead of leaving and letting you get ready for the day, though, Mabel sits right down on the edge of the mattress with you and looks at you expectantly. So... <laughs> How have things been going with Grunkle Stan? Has he told you about feelings yet? Have you two kissed? Uh, you're not sure you would tell her even if either of those did happen. Do I want to tease her? I kind of do. I kind of do want to tease her. Oh, yeah, sure. Both things. Lots of times. Really? Ah, oh, Tempest, you're just joking. 
Okay, maybe there hasn't been any milestones, but things are going great, right? What do you think? Absolutely, definitely. I think you should just tell him how you feel. I'll keep that in mind, but can I get changed now? Oh, right, silly me. Come on, Waddles. They leave and you're left to your thoughts. Though the hectic supernatural stuff in Gravity Falls inexplicably often finds itself in or near the shack, you haven't been able to spend much significant time with Stan since your boxing session. You only found short moments, like a late night game of cards that ran longer than expected because by the end of it, you both just let the deck on the table as you listened to him tell a story about how this one time he... Well, you guessed that was a significant amount of time. You just never really wanted those moments to end. And just yesterday, Form came up to you in the kitchen, standing with a bowl of cereal in hand that he was apparently in the middle of eating, and basically gave you a condensed version of, if you break my twin brother's heart, you'll I'll make you regret it. The bowl of cereal turning out to be 95% marshmallows did not make him seem any less intimidating. I'm not sure why he did that. As far as you know, there's nothing official between you and Stan. Besides... Stan and Ford don't even live on land anymore. They'll be setting sail again, exploring the seas and documenting the oddities of the world. From what you've heard about it already, it's intense stuff that keeps them on the move and untethered. And you're no expert, but your car's looking pretty close to done, meaning you'll be leaving Gravity Falls soon enough. All you can do is hope you're not leaving with any regrets. Oh. Heading out through the back door so that you don't disturb Susan's current tour, you round the house to see where your car stood still for the past two weeks. Sure enough, there you find Stan, staring thoughtfully into the hood before he spots you and brightens. Hey, how's it hanging, Tempest? Fancy finding you here. Fancy finding you here outside your own house where Ford told me you'd be. What can I say? I'm unpredictable. Never know where I'll be up to next. Car's almost good to go, as far as I can tell. Plan to take it for a quick test run around the town to make sure. Sounds fun. When do we go? You ain't coming. I don't want you inside if there's an explosion or something. There won't be, but it's a precaution. Uh, okay. But, if you are free tonight, I figured we would, uh, celebrate. Yeah, sure. What do you have in mind? Can't tell you. They just ruined the surprise. All you gotta do is worry about yourself. Maybe back here in a few hours. And wear your best duds. Stan shoots you a wing, twirling car- your car keys around his finger before he turns and gets into your car. Unsure why you couldn't go with him and, and hang out tonight, you wave goodbye and watch carefully as he revs the car to life. It works, and hey, no explosion. He gives you a thumbs up, which you return and pulls out onto the dirt road towards town. Handful of hours later, and it's just about time to get ready for your date. Stan got back to the shack a moment ago, and through the window you'd spotted Mabel talking to him outside. Though you couldn't figure out what they were saying, you laughed to yourself when she took his face in her hands, squishing his cheeks and looking him straight in the eye. A cute intimidation tactic, maybe? After rummaging through all the clothes you brought with you for your trip, you're relieved to find an outfit that fits the occasion. It's... Something classic, something flashy, something casual. Something classic. Feeling good about the outfit you chose, you head outside to meet Stan. You step out onto the back porch and are met with his back to you, looking off into the distance. You're about to call his name when he turns in your direction. Your words die on your tongue, speechless at the sight of him. He looks... handsome. Your eyes catch on the way his gold chain glints in the light, drawing your attention to his proudly exposed chest, helped framed by the cut of his shirt. Helpfully framed by the cut of his shirt. The buttons are almost strained to contain how good he looks, and your gaze follows the line lower to how Stan whistles playfully at the sight of you. Aren't you a sight for sore eyes? Do a turn around. You do a turn around, making sure to give an extra flourish as you spin. Stan's eyes light up as he laughs, tipping his imaginary hat to you in appreciation and whistling again. So, where to? And in his pocket, Stan nods over to the Stan mobile a few feet in front of you. Only one way to find out. He offers his arm and escorts you to the passenger side, opening and shutting the door for you before heading to the, over to the driver's side. While you were already looking forward to this, the way Stan makes you all the more eager. Uh, and that cologne, it, uh, it suits him. You watch him, thinking to yourself how crazy this all is. The ring is telling you to get a grip, but your cheeks are beginning to ache from smiling so much, and you can't bring yourself to mind. The El Diablo soon purrs to life, and you're on your way. Since you don't know your destination, you're not sure how long the ride will be. We lagging, oh no. Um, not like you mind at all. Hey, conversation. You always as mysteri mysterious with your dates? Luring them off into the night with a promise of a good time. Stan chuckles. 
Nah, only the ones I like being around. Hmm. Good to know. Besides, you should definitely know what to expect from a drive with me for now, by now. The unexpected? Bingo. You get out the window again, un unable to keep the smile from your face. Another minute or so passes before Stan speaks again. Alright, we're almost there. Close your eyes. Really? Yes, really. And I've got a blindfold in the glove box if you can't stop yourself from peeking. Somehow, it sounds like he's not joking with that last part. And after what you've seen with him, it wouldn't be a surprise. Leave that one alone. You laugh, but close your eyes as he told you to. It's fine. I've got it. Promise I won't peek. Keep your eyes closed for another minute or two as Stan tells, begins to tell you about the time he was hogtied and blindfolded by some thugs on the side of a desert road. Just as he gets to the good part about how he had to hitchhike using only his nose, the car comes to a stop. You hear, both hear and feel Stan put the car into park, and you realize there's muffled music not too far from you. Can I look now? Hold on. Stan exits the car, and the footfalls tell you he's walking to your side. In a second, he's there, opening your door. Can I look now? Stan chuckles. Unless you can walk with your eyes closed. You open your eyes to see... A rundown diner. Gre Greasy's diner, to be exact. The building is about as slightly shabby in appearance as it was when you last visited, but under the glowing We Have Food sign is an endearingly hand-painted banner reading Disco Night. Through the windows, you can spot energetic silhouettes and flashing multicolored lights. Hardly grandiose, but it's still beautiful. Oh my god, Stan. He takes your hand and helps you out of the passenger seat. What? You don't like it? You remembered. I know you've been dying to see the magic I make on the dance floor. It seemed cruel to keep you waiting any longer. Tease him. We'll see if you can keep up, old man. Oh, now you're in for it, kid. Hold on to your socks. As you step inside, you're greeted by the side of a dance floor. A disco ball reflects fragments of colorful spotlights all around the room, and even the cow skull above the jukebox has string lights wrapped around its horns. There's a good amount of people here. It's mostly older adults, which is unsurprising given the music genre. There are a few younger folks who seem to be enjoying themselves unironically. You're surprised you don't see Mabel and her friends there. You finally look back at Stan and catch him pretending he wasn't just watching you for your reaction seconds earlier. You didn't do all this just for me, did you? Nah, it's a monthly thing that picked up a while back. I lend some equipment for it every time. But it may have knocked it up a week or four. He's smirking. He's so proud of himself. You roll your eyes, but give him a fond smile. Well, then let's dance already. Grabbing Stan's hand and yours, you lead him onto the dance floor and he follows eagerly. Alright, we can stop, start you off with something easy. Nuh-uh. I need to see your moves first. Make sure they're the real deal. Got any requests, then? I'm not gonna make him dab. Do Foxtrot. I'm not the young buck I used to be, but I still got some Lindy Hop in me. Isn't that a different dance? That's not the point. So you're not gonna throw me around like a ragdoll. Got it. Please, I never do that in public. Unless you ask nicely. Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Sorry. And you dance before you know it, the song is passed, and then another, and another. You weren't too sure at first, but Stan's actually a really good dancer. He's light on his feet, and he's definitely got rhythm. He knows just where to guide you, how to hold you. Oh god, you hope your hands aren't sweaty. Are you sweaty? Your face sure feels hot when he shoots you a wink before leading you into a half turn that lands your back flush against his chest. You keep it up pretty good, Tempest. You having fun? He has to low in your ear in a way that makes your heart flutter as you sway together. Only because I have such an amazing partner. I could say the same thing. Stan laughs, brings you, st laughs, bringing you back to face him. The song ends only seconds later and he realizes his hold on you. It's a slow song, and Stan raises his brow at you questioningly. Take initiative. Of course you want to continue. Laughing, you take his hand and yours again and guide it back to your side. Stan beams and brings you closer still. About to rest your palms against his chest, but change your mind and rest them on his broad shoulders. You're almost nervous to look him in the eye, but when you t chance to glance upward, you're so pleased with what you see. You've been close before, intimately even, but this this is a whole new ballpark. Face to face, moving slowly as one, nothing to distract the one from the other's gaze. Try not to think about how good he smells or how comforted and electrified his hold makes you feel, and you, oh, and you definitely try to think about how a slight lean forward would easily bring his lips to yours. Hello. <laughs> 
The song changes again, almost too soon, you think. But Stan pick just picks up his tempo to match, keeping your proximity the same. By now, you don't even have to look at your feet. Pace quickens and you both get caught in it. A swing, a twirl, another swing. And you're dipped in Stan's arm so smoothly that it takes you a split second to realize why you're nearly upside down. Stan is grinning down at you, panting from the intense bout, holding the dip. Oh, guys. Okay, okay, hold on. No, we gotta save. Because I need to <laughs> Kissing him was the wrong choice. Okay, we're doing it. Okay, it's just a cheek kiss. Okay. Heart thrumming in your ears, you lean up, pecking him on the cheek with a chaste kiss. He chuckles and smiles down at you for a moment, for bringing you back up into his arms to finish off the dance right as the song ends. A quick glance around the room lets you know that most of the surrounding patrons are watching the two of you dance. They look away as you notice, some whispering and some getting back to their own technique. It's Stan who speaks first. You hungry? Ooh, not what you're expecting, but you're kind of relieved he's keeping the mood light. I'm grinning like an idiot right now and you guys can't see it. <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. Great, my treat, kid. Pick anything you want. Of course, the place he's most generous at is a diner whose most expensive entree is 20 bucks. Lucky for you, I only want some fries and a shake. Sounds perfect. Instead of waiting for a server to come by, Stan goes straight to the counter to order. You sit down in a pleasantly unsticky booth to wait for him and notice that Stan left his jacket in the seat next to you. Put it on. In no time, Stan returns with two orders of fries and two shakes. He grins when he sees his jacket draped over your shoulders. Hope you don't mind. I was feeling a bit chilly. Nah, that one looks good on you. And it's not wet this time. He sits, sliding in right next to you. It's been a long time since I just got fries and a shake from an old diner. Not usually something people my age do, I guess. They just don't know how to have a good time. True. They're all busy hating their spouses and drinking to forget. And paying taxes. <laughs> Stan grasps his chest in mock horror. Don't even say that. It gives me shivers at the very thought. Ready to dig in properly, you take a fry and dip it into your chocolate shake. Stan, ha handful of fries, ready oh, ready to be shoved in his gaping mouth, looks at you like you just screamed bloody murder. What? Did you just... What, you never tried it? No, of course not. It's delicious. Perfect mix of sweet and salty. Stan frowns. Don't knock until you try it. He scoffs, picking up a fry and dipping it into your shake instead of his own and plops it into his mouth. His eyes widen as he chews, silent until he swallows. That's actually not half bad. I keep accidentally right-clicking. Still in his fries. See from the moment he's off guard, you reach over and snatch a fry from his plate. Hey! Payback! Stan picks up your shake and takes a big ol' swig. Hey! He sets it back down, licking his lips triumphantly. He's missed a spot, though, and there's a bit of chocolate left on the side of his smirking mouth. Wipe it off for him. Hey, Stan, you got some... You lift your hand to his face and wipe the chocolate away with your thumb. Stan's breath hitches at your touch. While you absentmindedly lick the chocolate away, he's nearly beet red. You soon slip into the comfortable silence again as, as you survey the crowd and the couples on the dance floor. Everyone seems to be having a good time. It's nice seeing others enjoy something Stan helped put on. It seems he does more good than he likes to admit to himself. When he's not going on crime sprees or getting arrested, at least. Soon you're to the ends of your cups, and I picked up the last bits of your fries. Hey, you wanna get out of here? Lead the way. Soon you're back in the old Di Diablo, engine purring to life as Stan screeches out of the little parking lot and onto Main Street. With the way he drives, you honestly don't know how he keeps his car in such good shape, even with his mechanic skills. But eventually, your speed becomes reasonable as Stan transitions from the asphalt road to dirt, and you're left to realize that your quick impulse isn't due to his driving, but from anticipation. You taking me for, for some late night errands again? Nah, just thought we could see where the road takes us. You know, for a small town, it sure is huge. Tell me about it. This forest is more of a trap than the shack. Worked on me just fine. Uh, I can't take all the credit on that one. Sure, Ford's babe magnet helped. Stan barks out a laugh at that. But I was drawn to this place on my own, too. I mean, it's grown on me. Like a fungus, sure, but it has. But I'm not the kind of guy who hikes trails or draws gnomes. That's my brother. I'd rather be in the city than the woods. Way fewer bugs, more people to pickpocket, and not everyone knows my face. 
So then, how does someone like you end up in a place like this? You said you're from Jersey, right? I know how everyone else has gotten here, but not you. Sam sighs, as if the weight of his whole life stories lies with that question. Luckily, he humors you. Long, and I mean long, story short. My brother and I had a falling out when we were kids. High school. I got kicked out, barely talked to him, or my parents for ten years. He moved here. Spent those years bouncing from state to state. Oregon was one of the few I hadn't been banned from. I'm sorry. Stan just scoffs. Eh, it was far from the worst of it. He asked me to come here, shit hit the fan, and then it was another 30 years before I got to see him again. Didn't even know if he was alive, but the reason why he was gone was my fault. That's terrible. Yeah, well, it's the past. Obviously, we're close again, almost too close. Having to live on the boat with- live on the boat with- bleh, Having to live on a boat with the nerd really tried my patience at the time, I'll tell you that. Still, the complaint has fallen in its gruffness. By now, it feels like you've been driving for a good while. You're starting to wonder if Stan really does have no idea where he's going. So the thought stops in his tracks as the car makes a sharp turn on a diverging path. You catch the slightest glimpse of a wooden sign reading, Do not enter. Uh, Stan, where are we going? Relax, Tempest. I know what I'm doing. There's this real hot spot up ahead on the cliff's edge. Let's see the whole town, the horizon, and everything. Real picturesque. That sounds amazing. The car suddenly jerks left, and there's a troubling bump as you go over a large redwood root. That is, if we don't die before we get there. Sorry, kid. That one was in my blind spot. It's pitch black outside, Stan. Everything's a blind spot. Alright, alright. Hold on. One more jump and we're in the clear. Hold on. You grasp the back of your seat in one hand and the car's door handle with another, unsure of how big a bump he has in mind. It's worse than you expected. Stan's accelerating enough that you swear the heels have left the ground. Wheels have left the ground until landing hard enough that Stan finds it necessary to brace you with his own arm, keeping you from slamming your head into the dashboard. Thanks, bestie. Stan Mobile pulls up to its destination at the cliff's edge, just as Stan said. You have a perfect view of the whole st town, the surrounding canyon, and the mar remarkably saucer-esque shape cut into the natural bridge. Uh, you catch Stan's please, please grin from the corner of your eye as you gasp, taking it all in. Though the sun has long set, the small glowing streetlights from the small town illuminate the surrounding trees, providing only a hint, slight hint of the mountain shadows. It's not until seeing it from up here that like this that it sinks in just how secluded from the world gravity falls is it's almost like a hidden treasure among the evergreens and though the black thick forestry behind where you're parked might seem daunting alone at night with here with stan it just feels promising so i'm guessing you like it right it's beautiful as you survey the scene you realize this cliff seems rather untouched save for a flimsy barrier made of wire and stakes just before its end how did you find this place well, there's this other spot just like this one that I'm told the kids call Lookout Point. It's just across from us, actually. Sam points to the spot opposite the car, straight ahead. Huh. The place is infested with teenagers, though. I saw it myself when I drove up here to help Dipper with the girl situation. Teenagers. Gross. Exactly. It hits you more fully now that you're here with Stan, alone together, away from the world as you know it. You're thrilled, anxious, and suddenly you don't know what to do with your hands. A nervous giggle escapes you, and Stan offers a kind and reassuring smile in return as he slings his arm along the back of his seat, crossing his leg over the other. The casual air is contagious, and you're thankful for it. So, how did you kill time in a place like this for 30 years? Besides all the shack and secret portal stuff. Stan laughs, scratching his cheek. Well, as you know, I'm full of surprises. I skip town every now and then for actual supplies or a promising hookup. But as the shack became a household name, I had to stay put for longer and longer. So I try to make do trying to so I'd make do trying to enjoy the small town thing. You settle in. You're not budging until he elaborates. Like what though? The fun stuff like disco nights. Stan scans the horizon, looking for something. Okay, uh, there. You see the bowling place? We used to have a team there. We were really good, thanks to yours truly. Till this wet blanket Toby came on board and had to use bumpers like a baby. Again, he didn't mean to laugh. Yikes. You got that right. Aside from that, there's this great taco joint and bar. Kids like to go to the arcade, and the mini golf place is pretty decent. He starts counting on his fingers. There's a mall, a creepy animatronic pizza place, a public pool, which I would not recommend, by the way, unless you're into sitting in strangers' filth. It all sounds pretty dang fun, minus the filth part. 
Seems sounds like there's actually a lot to do around here. It's weird, ain't it? It's like you'll never hear about a place, but if the situation calls for it, pow, it's right here in town. You like hearing Stan talk. About anything, really. The way he emotes with his hands, the grit in his voice, and the gradual increase of enthusiasm when he gets passionate, even about something small. And of course, he never fails to make you laugh. You could listen to him all night long. So you prepare to do just that, adjusting your legs into a more relaxed position. Nothing wrong with taking advantage of the leg room in these wide bench seats. About... That weirdly shit building. That's the club. Shoot him a look. Stan makes it through his next words laughing. That's the name, honest. You snort. Clever? The name might be questionable, but the place is only is nice enough to only let you in if you're rich. I've only ever managed to sneak in there once. Bad vibes there, even for someone like me. Worst of all, the food was mediocre. Not the kind of, kind of quality I didn't pay for. What about the graveyard? Eh, nothing special there. Not even that spooky. I'm sure the Grave of America's lost president is there, and something about a national treasure, but I went there for myself for artifact inspiration, and there wasn't even a decent headstone to steal. What about the factory on that cliff nearby? You know, I'm surprised that place is still even there. Used to be this attraction in the middle of town. This brat, giddy and gleeful. Hold on, gleeful? Like, bud gleeful? The car dealership guy gleeful? Yeah, Getty and his bud snot-nosed kid. They used to run the scam that made money off of poor suckers' hopes and dreams by posing Gideon as a psychic. Oh no. It's just as tasteless as you're probably imagining. And even dance around and sing like a monkey in a tux. So what? I had a real monkey at the shack back then. War hat and everything. Anyway, those idiots obviously ate it all up. It became my biggest competition and even bigger pain in my ass. That old factory's where they used to make his merchandise. What happened to Gideon? Kid had some realizations, I guess. Like a lot of people in this town, supposedly he's trying to get that silver spoon out of his mouth and just be a normal tween like the rest of them. Who knows? I haven't heard about him this visit, so I can't tell you for sure. That must be a good sign. There's a lull in the conversation, a moment where both of you are simply admiring the view. It seems you've inched your way closer to Stan as he was speaking because all of a sudden you realize that your leg isn't all that far from his. The reflection of the outside light on Stan's glasses keeps you from being able to read his expression from this position. You very nearly closed the gap between you both, and it would have been smooth too if not for the creak of the patent leather seat as you shifted. <laughs> Stan's grin tells you he noticed. Damn, time for a diversion. What's that on the water tower over there? Ah, that old chestnut. What's it look like to you? Explosion. Seems like it's supposed to be a mushroom cloud, but it's not very good. There should be more rings and lines of detail in the middle to get the shape across. You know, I almost died up there once. It's a real doozy of a story. You take the bait. Oh, do tell. And so he does, with his usual flourish, painting a picture of the time he and his great niece bravely st scaled the tower and nearly got shaken from it by a video game character come to life. You find yourself with another chance to move closer. Get even closer! Stan's speech falters a bit as you inch closer and the side of your hand brushes his, but he continues when you leave it there. It's, it's so I say to Mabel, having just looked death straight in, in its... Just looked death straight in its dumb, ugly face. Finally, your thigh meets his, and suddenly he seems to have a pretty persistent itch on the back of his head because he can't stop rubbing it. And so the punk Robbie learned his lesson eventually, but you know how his type are. I think I have an idea, yeah. Your eyes meet Stan's, and you hope to God he can't tell your heart is hammering in your chest. Screw it, here goes nothing. Ooh. You still your nerves, moving and gently resting your head on Stan's shoulder, leaning into his side. You hold your breath as you focus on the water tower in front of you, worried about what look he could be giving you. Stan clears his throat, pulling his arm away from you, and for a moment, that feeling you just cr cross a line makes you mentally curse yourself, till he lets out an embarrassingly fake yawn, and his arm above his head and out, resting in across your shoulders. You're so excited by his touch and your success, it takes you a moment to realize the yawn and stretch. He just used that old cliche. And moreover, it worked. <laughs> Iconic of him, actually. <laughs> it's called Madden. You can't help but laugh. What? Stan reddens, smiling sheepishly down at you. I cannot believe you just did the yawn and stretch. Oh my god. Ah, uh, well, it worked, didn't it? Is it still a trick if it's recognized as one right off the bat? Stan's silent for a moment for making a face. Eesh, there goes my seven days without an extension crisis streak. 
Now that you're against the side, you don't, re you really don't know what to do with your damn hands. Are they feeling a little extra swe sweaty? Curse these leather seats. Ooh, ooh. Okay. Um, I want to make sure I make the right decision here. Put one aside. Okay, again, as casually as possible, you decide to rest a hand on Stan's leg, just above his knee. At your contact, Stan coughs on his own surprise. You're about to remove yourself from him and apologize, but he stops you by beating you to it. Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. It's fine, I just had a little something stuck in my uh, flagella. For, bear for a moment, you dared not say a thing and instead close your eyes. There's that sense again, that overtone of cheap cologne mingled with leather, cigar smoke, and salt. From this proximity in the car, it's just the right kind of overwhelming. You really can't believe this. Never in your wildest imagination could you imagine this is how your solo summer road trip would work out. But in this moment, you really can't imagine it any other way. You're just... happy. Oh. Oh, the art style. Oh, guys. Hold on, I'm gonna turn off the PNG tuber for a minute. You can just get a look at him. Okay. I'm also gonna take a screenshot. Hey, Stan? Yeah? Thanks for your help. His eyes meet your own as he smiles down at you. No problem, kid. It's what kind souls like me do. Hold on, guys. I have 11 notifications from TikTok. I need to check this out. I'm making sure that I'm not missing any notifications here. Sometimes stuff gets caught in my comment filters. Okay. All good. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, you really are a lifesaver. Seriously, my car would have been a goner. And you rescued me from being bled dry by a mechanic, too. You can feel the rumble in Stan's chest as he hums. Crooks. All of them. Not even charismatic about it. That's certainly a plus two. The hand moves upwards towards his broad chest as below the, v of the open V of his shirt. I'm not only thankful for a place to freeload, though, Stan. I've actually had a really incredible time here. Seriously, I'm the luckiest person to ever be ripped out of the forest with their car and since it was by such a nice family. Better than a simple trip to the mystery shack, huh? Definitely. Oh, God! You can't make me do this right now. Okay. Well, now we definitely have to save it here. Oh god, okay. Hold on, guys. I'm letting you have the webcam. I don't have my lights on behind me, but I figure maybe you want to see the, uh, my live reaction. Let me get my lights off. Okay, here we go. Kiss him! Oh, are you kidding me? About to lean in when Stan looks sharply up. Following his gaze, you spot tw twin lights on the cliff across from you are his headlights. Uh, great, just what we needed. Guess we should start heading back. He offers you an apologetic smile. 
Okay, no, hold on. I want to see what happens if I say, tell them how you feel. Bale's words come back to you, and despite your doubts begging you not to not say anything stupid, your heart is telling you, yelling at you to tell him already, damn it. You, you know what? Yeah, if everything goes south, you're already about to pack your bags and leave. You never even have to think of the name Gravity Falls ever again. All right, yep, here it goes. Stan, I really like you. You focus on the gold chain just by your fingertips and toy with it, avoiding eye contact to keep your nerves while you've got them. You can hear a swallow thickly despite your heart thrumming in your ears. I've really enjoyed getting to know you these past couple weeks. Even when you got me shot at. I can't tell you how much of a relief it's, it's been to not only escape death by complete boredom, but also to find myself having some of the most fun I've ever had, period. You need an extra gulp of air for this next part. Thank you for tonight. I'm glad you brought me here. And I'm gonna miss you. A glance up and there Stan is, looking at you with a mix of emotions you can't quite place. You think you can f you feel his pulse skip a beat under your palm, and you're sh sure your own does the same as he looks away. His pronounced jawline is further exaggerated in the shadows, so you can see it clench before he faces you again. Oh! This is the better decision! <laughs> you don't know who leans in first or more or anything, but suddenly Stan's hand is cupping your face and his lips are on yours. It's sweet, but somewhat clumsy, as his glasses remind you of their existence by hitting you in the cheek as he leans in close. You can't help but hum against his lips. And, oh god, you forgot to breathe. Hey, part, both of you breathing just a bit heavier than before. Stan's big, dumb grin is accompanied by pink-dusted cheeks. I have to... I have to tell my friend. Hold on. I'm giving my friend live updates. <laughs> It'd be rude of me to not tell them. <laughs> Was that or you okay? Ooh, 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 kiss him again. What a dork. This time you're holding his face as you kiss him again. You're pleased to find it's even better a second time. You better say something more when Stan looks sharply up. Okay, so this was ultimately the better path. Ah, uh, great, just what we needed. Guess we should start heading back. He offers you an apologetic smile. We should, but can we take the scenic route? Yeah, absolutely. Luckily, the scenic route is also the long way home. You're mostly joking about a scenic route back to the shack during this time of night, but both Gravity Falls and Stan have a way of amazing you to no end. Little bioluminescent mushrooms are sprinkled along the path on the trees in perfect rings. Stan drives slowly and you take advantage of it to marvel at the greenish glow. This is incredible. <laughs> There's a lot more where, they, where these came from. Or so I've heard. There's a gnome forest somewhere around here. Never been, because, well, gnomes. Maybe Ford can let us know if there's somewhere like it without the pests. You rest your head on the windowsill, catching the, watching the toadstools of all shapes and sizes go by, counting them. I'd really like that. Okay, no more webcam. PNG tuber time. Okay. With each passing minute, the rumble of the road and the thrum of the car seem to add another weight to your eyelids, and suddenly your fatigue catches up with you. Hold on, work email. Ready. Uh, you're right. You have an, affir an affirmative, and Stan takes you at your word. Well, this could be better. Sliding up next to him, you bring Stan's free arm that's not in the wheel around yourself, like it was earlier this evening, and he chuckles. That's right, get yourself comfortable. 
You let your eyes fall closed, content. Wake me up if there's a nymph or something. Will do, Tempest. Oh, it went way up. It was like here, and now it's like all the way up here. Y'all, I can't stop now. I mean, it's the last day. It's your last day in Gravity Falls. Weeks ago, you were worried today would never come. But now that it's here, you don't know how to feel. Just yesterday, when Stan told you your car was good to go, you wanted to believe there was something still left around to fix. And yesterday evening, after your final dinner with the whole Pines family and Seuss's back-breaking goodbye hug, you'd almost resigned yourself to letting go. But now, in the clarity of daylight, you realize that these weird and wonderful people don't have to disappear from your life for good. You'll always have the memories, and you'll still be able to keep in touch through letters, packages, and video calls. They won't be able to get rid of you, even. Too late, suckers. Cherish friends for life. No, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave, guys. When you make your way out of the shack, you're met by the pines and waddles, all gathered beside a large tarp, covering what you guess is your car. They're talking amongst your themselves until they spot you. There he is. Thought you were going to miss the big reveal. Now, you guys. Port and Stan each take in a, a, the tarp, pulling it off with a flourish as Mabel and Dipper throw handfuls of confetti in the air. Ta-da! The reveal is, indeed, your car. Besides a couple of nicks here and there, it's hard to believe it's the same one you crashed just weeks ago. Heck, it probably runs better than it did when you first got it. It looks amazing. You take it all in, running your hands along the hood and marveling at the spotless windows. Ford, can I call you next time I need a tune-up? This is what happens when you use that magnet gun. I might ask you to total my car more often. <laughs> yes, perhaps we can find a middle ground. Hey, hey, no love for me, huh? Don't forget who got you out of this mess in the first place. I could never, trust me. I'll think of every time I can use my windshield wipers without jamming the button. You laugh, giving Stan a big hug in gratitude. Thank you, Stan. Turn to the whole family, taking the moment in. And thanks to all of you for everything. It's been unforgettable. Familiar, familiar car keys back in hand. You unlock your car and load your belongings into the trunk. Bibba comes up and hands you a package wrapped entirely in ribbons and bows, winking. Just something to remember us by. Stan calls from where he stands with Ford to the left of your car. I don't know what that is, but it's from me too. And, uh, me. Dipper simply shoots you a thumbs up, and when you look at the label on Mabel's gift, you see his name is already on it besides hers. I want to open it. You're already you're about to pull out the ribbons, but Mabel chides you. No, you gotta open it on the road after you leave. Or well, after you stop at a rest stop because you're driving. Please don't get into another accident. You tuck the gift into the trunk on top of everything else, making sure it'll be safe from being crushed. After Mabel, Waddles comes up to you as well, and he snorts at you. You get the little guy a loving pat. You're going to miss that pig. You're really going to miss Gravity Falls too. I I don't know what to say except I guess. You're about to say goodbye when Stan interrupts you. Uh, hold on. I got one more thing to say before you go. And the uh, kids, you hit on in first. You two sixer, give us some time alone. I, uh, gotta show him some kinks with that engine. Mabel ooze as she leaves. They're coming Dipper and Ford back into the shack. You think that was altogether too easy, and Stan must think so too, because he turns back to the shack's visual window just as Mabel peeks out from the side of the window pane. Alone, Mabel. Mabel disappears from the window, and Stan, Stan turns back to you. Well, it's been... It's been some couple weeks, huh? Gotta say, I'm usually on the other side of this conversation. If there's a conversation at all, that is. Look, never been any good at this stuff, so I'll just cut right to the chase. If this was just a summer thing, I get it. I really do. But if it were more... It's more! It's obviously more! It's more! Listen... I'm into this old man. I don't care. I'm proud to say it. <laughs> then laughs with, with relief. <laughs> really? I mean, of course, really. I'm a fantastic catch. You lucked out with this one, kid. Honestly, Stan, you're not wrong. You don't come off as the uh, long-distance type. I was afraid to ask, so I wasn't sure I had the guts. But I'm glad you did. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there's still a few things I could get better hang of. You give him a warm look of your own, letting your fondness show, and Stan flushes under your gaze. Uh, I guess I should give you my number. Wait, you already have that, uh... Damn, I'd like a proper goodbye kiss. 
Stan's kiss is, grin is contagious. I'm just got kissing on the mind. You barely lean in before he meets you with a purposeful kiss, one that holds promise. It's enough to bring you back to memories of that night in his car on the cliff. Oh yeah, you'll definitely be staying in touch. Just as you're about to deepen the kiss, the high-pitched squirrel rips your attention from, me, from each other to the sound's origin. <laughs> I'm teasing my friend because they missed everything. <laughs> they missed all the good stuff. Um, ripped your attention from each other to the sound's origin to find that it's not only the Mabel pressing up against the shack's window. I knew you could do it, Grogo Stan. I knew it. Love at last. A small hand comes into view and grabs her away from the window before a six fingered one waves and draws the curtain shut. Stan looks a bit peeved at being interrupted but relaxes as you laugh. You got some really good kids there, Stan. Trust me, I know. They will talk me through some of the rough spots, believe it or not. Oh, I do. Maybe next time me and Ford Doc, we can uh, pick up where we left off. Another more chase peck on the on the lips serves as your answer. I'll hold you to it, sailor. Don't forget me now, all right? I swear I'll spam tech. I'll, blah, blah, blah. I'll spam you with text messages if you do. Dipper, show me how. <laughs> Dipper's a real one for that. Laughing, you say your final goodbye with one last look at him. Couldn't forget you if I tried. See you later, Stan. Stan watches as you get in your car and start up the engine. You turn onto the road with ease, and in the rearview mirror, see Stan waving goodbye, as well as Dipper, Mabel, and Ford from the shack. You smile at the sight and say a last goodbye to the quiet of your car, watching until you have to focus on the road once more. A little while longer, and you're back through town, back on the open road. A sign passes on the right, now leaving Gravity Falls. Wanna leave. It's not until you're at the next rest stop that you think to open Mabel's gift, or well, the Pines family's gifts. You unwrap it to find a small mystery shack souvenir. To find mystery stack souvenirs, a small knitted square that Mabel has helpfully labeled as a mug, sweater, and a photo. The end. Thank you for playing. Wow. We are definitely going to have to um play Ford's Route sometime. I definitely want to do that at some point. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and shut off PG Tuber. Love game time. Hello. Takes a bit for this thing to close. Slay. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. There we go. So that was a fun stream. Definitely a shorter one in comparison to yesterday. But this game was fun. Um, I don't know. I might just do Ford's route, like, on my own time. I don't know if I want to stream this again. As fun as it is, it is just a lot of reading. I don't know how entertaining that is for anybody else. Um, and I don't particularly like reading out loud a whole bunch. Um, I don't like reading out loud. I don't really like the visual novel type games, which is why I haven't continued the other dating sim that I've played. Um, I don't think I'm going to. Um, anyways. I'm gonna go do stuff. I think I'm tired. <laughs> it has been a long day. It's been a long week, honestly. <laughs> This job- the job is pretty tiring, I'll admit. And I almost- like, I almost just didn't stream today, but I'm glad I did. But, um, yeah, we got some socials flapping on the bottom of the screen here. 
got an Instagram where I post cosplay photos and stuff if you want to see that. I haven't updated in a while, though, so you might want to do it. I have a new TikTok, which I have yet to um, update the graphic for. It is this. It is Gorgeous, which is a play on Gorgeous. Um, I have a main YouTube where I have uploaded the first episode of a Phoenix Wright gameplay. Um, next one should be coming out at some point. And then I have a Twitter if you want to check that out for whatever reason. Um, we have a Discord server, which is linked here on my Twitch profile, um, where you can be notified every time I go live and upload. I'm also going to set it up so you can, um, get pings for when I post on TikTok, because I've been posting a lot more frequently on there. So if you want to have that, um, if you want to have those notifications, then you can. Um, because that's pretty fun. Um... You can also suggest future streams and videos. Um, I'm always looking for things to react to, things to play, both on stream and for YouTube. So if you have something that you want to see me react to or play, go, just feel free to suggest it. You can also suggest it during the stream. Um, I'll, like, as soon as I have, like, a free moment, I'll write it down so I don't forget about it. I can't guarantee that I'll do it, but... Usually, if it's if I can get my hands on the game, if it's a game, or if it's something that I haven't seen before, then I'll I'll end up doing that. So you can always suggest that stuff um, on streams as well. Not just you don't have to be in the Discord to do that. And I will get to it eventually. And if I can't, then I will be very clear about that from the beginning. But yeah, there's not a whole lot else I want to talk about. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the stream here. I hope you guys had a good night, day, evening morning, whatever time it is for you. And this is Tempest signing off. Bye-bye!